Okay, here we go. How's it going, everyone? Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to Tech Talks. Tech Talks is a webinar series from the Lyles College of Engineering here at Fresno State. My name is Jose Maciel. I'm a senior computer engineering student in the Lyles College of Engineering. I'm also vice president for the Ada Kappa Nu, which is the Electrical and Computer Engineering Honor Society here at Fresno State as well. I was also part of the Valley Industry Partnership for Cooperative Education Program, or otherwise known as the VIP program. It's kind of a mouthful, you know, it's a big acronym. Um, uh, this program is very unique. Uh, it's a unique partnership between a lot of uh, leading companies all around and the Lyos College of Engineering, uh, who developed an initiative to provide internship opportunities for qualified students of junior and senior level standing. Um, uh, this involves completing two full-time six-month internships and let me tell you that from personal experience it is a very invaluable experience and opportunity so if you have a chance to apply or look into it uh, go ahead and do so I will put more information uh, for it in the chat uh, during the presentation so if you want to take a look at it go ahead uh, the deadline to apply is next Friday October 16th and the interviews and selections are taking place uh, around two weeks after that October 30th um, uh, but let's switch over to today's webinar, uh, which is also sponsored by the VIP, the Lyles College, and Ada Kappa Nu. Um, <clears throat> and we would like to give a huge uh, welcome to today's guest speaker, Mr. Daniel Castro. Uh, like we said in the bio, Daniel is a patent attorney and entrepreneur. He's lived in Fresno since 2008, but grew up in East LA, where he graduated from Garfield High. Uh, at Garfield High, Daniel was part of Jaime Escalante's Math and Science program, from which the movie Stand and Deliver was based, which if you haven't watched it, you must. It is an amazing movie, um, and I'm pretty sure Daniel can, can attest to that. He received both a bachelor's degree and master's degree from MIT, where he majored in electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, at MIT, uh, Daniel had the privilege of taking a course with Dr. Omar Bose, uh, which is, the, if the last, main, last name sounds familiar, is because he is the audio pioneer and founder of Bose Corporation. Dr. Bose mentored him and recommended that he merge his love for technology and writing by pursuing a career in patent law. And after that, Daniel attended and graduated from UC Berkeley, where, he st where his studies focus on patent law and various other aspects of intellectual property. Uh, Daniel has worked in patent for over 20 years, patent law field, and is currently a partner at the law firm of Loza & Loza. He's represented several Fortune 500 companies, including Microsoft, AT&T, Qualcomm, and many more. Uh, Daniel is also a CEO of Opjar, um, where he... Uh, which is a fintech startup, and he recently co-founded with his classmates from MIT and UC Berkeley to address the country's wealth gap problem in which an unacceptable number of kids uh, enter adulthood with little to no savings. And I'm pretty sure he's going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, questions, if you guys have questions, uh, if the audience has any questions, go ahead and please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window, not the chat feature, use the Q&A. So uh, that way Daniel can answer them throughout the presentation. But if he doesn't get to it, don't worry, we do have a Q&A section at the end of the presentation. So be sure to stay tuned. Uh, with, with, that, with that out of the way, I want to, it's a great honor to present Mr. Daniel Castro. And take it away. All right. Thanks, Jose. I, I, I appreciate it. All right. I'm going to be sharing my screen. Give me a sec. All right. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again for the invitation. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much, Jose, for the kind introduction. Uh, so for today, I'd like to share a little bit about my background and how that impacted my career choices. So um, I'll begin with, uh, let me share with you that like many of you, I'm sure I'm first generation. My dad's from Peru and my mom's from Uruguay. So, and I learned Spanish before I learned English. Um, and uh, so I was born in New York actually. I was born in New York, but I grew up in East Los Angeles. I moved to East Los Angeles when I was seven years old. So uh, here uh, I mentioned that, you know, since I grew up in East LA, that makes me part Mexican. Okay, so East LA, it's very similar to parts of Fresno. Um, East LA is a poor working class neighborhood, predominantly Latino. Um, and growing up, family was and remains extremely important to me. Uh, and as much as I loved East LA, there was, you know, there was a lot that, uh, you know, there were a lot of challenges growing up in East LA. There was a lot of crime, a lot of gangs. 
and uh, so growing up, I really my what I what I wanted most is I I wanted to get my family out. I want to get my family out of East LA, and you know, as early as as early as I can remember, elementary school, I wanted to get them out, um, but I just, I just didn't know how. It was, you know, and I'm sure many of you can relate to that, um, but I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Like Jose mentioned, um, I was part of uh, the the Jaime Escalante Math and Science Program in East Los Angeles. And uh, I'll be the first to admit that I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. If I would have lived three blocks to the west, I would have went to a different high school, and I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been here speaking to you today. So, um, as as I grew up, elementary school, middle school, and high school, like many of you, for whatever reason, I was always very comfortable with math. And uh, um, it was really a perfect storm because having that comfort level with math and ha having the Escalante program there at my high school, it was, like I said, it was just a right place at the right time. And before the Escalante program, I, I wanted to get my family out of East LA, but like I said, I didn't know how, but with the program, it was it was made very simple, and uh, if you if you're familiar with, with the with the movie, Jaime Escalante, he was yeah you know, he was a great teacher, he was. But with the program, I think what was really um, what was really significant and really um, powerful about the program was it was very simple. They believed in us. They believed in us when several people didn't. And that, that was important. That, that was extremely important. So here with the program, the program, a big, a big component of the program was connecting with each of the students and figuring out why it is that they want something more. Because learning, learning calculus, and I'm sure many of you could agree it's not it's not trivial it requires work and uh, when i was in high school we had to you know we had to stay after class we had to go to go to class in the weekends we had to be part of the program over the summer and why were we doing that why and that getting to that why was the, the most important part understanding why the students wanted to, 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 to do something more. And for me, it was simple. It was my family. That's, that's, that's what I wanted. I wanted to get my family out. I didn't know how. And here with the program, it was made very clear to me from the beginning, right from middle school when, when, I, when I began with the program. The, the solution, if I really wanted to get my family out, was I had to stay in the program, and I had to get straight A's. And I, the, my why was so extremely important for me that that's what I did. And from that day forward, I just never got, I just never got a B anymore. That's, that's how important it was to me. And uh, you know, the, if, you, if you're familiar with the movie, the, the term ganas is, um, is tossed around a lot. And ganas, it, it, just, it just means how bad do you want it, right? How how bad do you how bad do you want it? And for me, I I wanted it really bad. I really I really wanted to help help my family out. I really wanted to get my family out, and uh, and 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 that that's that's what motivated me. Okay. So uh, so after high school, I was fortunate enough to get accepted to MIT, and. Uh, when I got to MIT, and uh, I'll, I'll share my experience here, which um, some of you uh, may, have, may be going through a similar experience right now. I knew that I was good at math. I just didn't know what I was going to do with it, right? So, you know, in high school, 
you know, I'm, I'm here playing with X, Y, Z. Um, you know, I, I understand calculus, but what am I going to do with it? I had no idea. None. So when I, when I got to college and it came time for me to, uh, to choose majors, I, I really didn't know what to major in. But my thought process, and it was very, you know, it's going to sound awful, but my thought process was, well, what major is going to make me the most money, right? Because again, my why was my family. And at the time, electrical engineering and computer science was and continues to, to be the, 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 the most popular major. So that's what I chose. That's what I chose. And, and folks, uh, you know, folks at, at MIT told me that, hey, that is, you know, it's supposedly the toughest major at, at MIT. And I, I, I don't, you know, maybe it was just ignorance on, on my part. Maybe, um, you know, maybe it was just being naive, but I, I, didn't, I didn't care. I, I really didn't because I, I figured, well, everything's going to be hard. Why not just, you know, my, might as well, might as well major in, in, uh, in double ECS since, you know, th that, that's, what's going to get my, my family out. So that, that's what I chose. And, and, you know, the, you know, just going back to the why for, for, for a second, um, cause, uh, you know, after MIT, I ended up going to, going to law school and, and, uh, the question that, that I get often is, you know, was MIT hard, right? Was law school hard? Was being a patent attorney hard? And and I tell them, and this is gonna sound this is gonna sound you know arrogant, but I tell them no. I tell them no, and and I say that with a with a with a straight face, right? Because um, because I think about my mom, and I think about my I think about my dad. And I think about how hard they worked and, you know, making, you know, working 50, 60 hours a week for, you know, for minimum wage or in the case of my, of my dad, less than minimum wage. And, and I thought, yeah, you know what? There were times at MIT where I had to pull an all nighter and I had to, you know, stay up late and, you know, it, it was challenging right? It was challenging. It, it was, it, it wasn't trivial, but what was really hard was what my mom did and what my dad did. My mom, my mom came to this country at 19 years old and not knowing anyone, not speaking English. And, uh, you know, what she did, that was hard. You know, what my dad did, that was hard. And here, you know, here in the Valley, you know, I'm sure, Many of you, uh, you know, many of you have experiences, you know, working out in the fields or, or your parents worked out in the fields. That's hard. That, that's what's really hard. At the end of the day at MIT, you know what? I was in an air conditioned library playing with numbers. That's what I was doing. So, you know, I, it's, it's always hard for me to, uh, I always just imagine my mom and, and thinking, you know, if she were to hear me say, you know, complain about how hard, how hard MIT was, I know that she would, you know, she would laugh at me. So, um, so anyhow, so when I, when I was, when I was in college, I, you know, I, I majored in, in double ECS. I, you know, I, I still wasn't really quite sure what I wanted to do with double ECS. Um, I, uh, I did a couple of internships, uh, summer internships. Uh, and, you know, I, I love technology. Don't get me wrong. I, I love technology, but I felt like, you know, I, I felt like it, it just wasn't, you know, being an engineer just wasn't quite the right fit for me. And I, I didn't really know why. I, I, didn't, I didn't really know why. Um, and as I, you know, as I continued, you know, from, you know, from my freshman year, sophomore year, then in my junior year, I, uh, I, I, I was fortunate enough to, 
uh, to have Professor Bose as one of my professors. And him and I, we had a really good relationship. And uh, at the time, I was double majoring in Latin American studies. So he knew that I loved to, uh, I loved to write. He knew I loved technology, he knew I loved to write. And uh, he, he asked me one day, he said, hey, have you, have you ever thought about patent law? And I was honest with him. I said, you know what, I, I, don't, I have no idea what that is. So what Professor Bose did was he, he set up a lunch for me to have with his patent attorney. And his patent attorney, his patent attorney just happened to be an old classmate of Professor Bose's from back in, they, they went to MIT together. I think there was class of like 1950 something or 1960 something, but, but they, they were classmates at MIT. And both of them were electrical engineering and computer science majors, like I was. Both of them got into the master's program at MIT, like I did. Well, Professor Bose, after grad school, he ended up creating this speaker empire. And his buddy, his classmate, went to law school. He ended up going to Harvard Law School. <clears throat> and he ended up being a patent attorney. And his blue chip client was Professor Bose. So Bose Speakers continues to be, um, continues to be a client of, um, his, his name's Chuck Hyken, I recall, Chuck Hyken. He, so, so the Bose Corporation was his client and his law firm ended up growing to be one of the largest and most prestigious law firms in the world. <clears throat> so anyhow, so I, I had this lunch with, uh, with Chuck and uh, he was the one that introduced me to this world of patent law. And right there and then I knew that it was for me. And why is that? Well, I mentioned earlier that I had already done a few internships, engineering internships. And uh, like I said, I, I liked it. I liked them. I liked the, the internships that, that I did, but I felt like there was something missing and I, I, I couldn't quite put my, my finger on it. And after, after talking to Chuck, I realized that, you know what? I just don't have the attention span. So I, I, I love technology, but after, you know, after a few weeks, I'm, I'm kind of done with it. And uh, to be an engineer, you have, you have to really roll up your sleeves. And, you know, if you're, if you're on a project, you're going to be on that project for a while, for months, if not, you know, if not years. And for my personality, and, you know, everybody's personality is different, but for my personality, for my attention span, that, that wasn't the right fit. But as a patent attorney, and this is what I discovered uh, with, at this lunch, with a patent attorney, what, what you do as a patent attorney is you, you come, the inventors invent what they invent. And then the patent attorney comes once it's been invented and you you basically, you basically arrive at the end after everything is done. So the, the engineers may have been working on this project for several months, and then the patent attorney uh, arrives you know, when it's all done. And I get out my notebook and I ask them to explain to me what, what, they've, uh, what they've invented. And my job as a patent attorney then is is to essentially draft a glorified lab report describing, describing the invention, arguing why and how it's different from, from other inventions that are trying to address the same problem. And that whole process will take maybe about a week, maybe two, let's just say. And uh, after I'm done drafting that patent application, I submit it and that's it. And then 
off to off to the next to the next uh, the, the next patent application. So, what did I do? So, I after MIT, after MIT, I was supposed to go directly to law school uh, because, again, for you know, the the whole point of going to MIT in the first place was to make money for my family, as awful as that sounds, to to get them out of East LA. So, when uh, when I got to MIT, of course, you know what. Well, the original plan was I was going to be there for four years, come back, get my family out. I got into the grad program, the, the master's program, and four years became six years. So then after, after, the, uh, you know, after I graduated, uh, after I got my master's, I, I had a dilemma. I had a dilemma. I had to decide, well, do I go straight to law school? Should be three more years, or do I go back home and help my family out? And uh, for me, it, it was a big dilemma. And uh, I reached out to Chuck, my de facto mentor, and uh, I, I told him, "Hey, you know, what should I do?" And he said, "You know what? Law school is going to be there forever." Just go back home. Just go back home. You can work as a as a patent agent. Work for a couple of years as a patent agent. Get some get some experience, and then go to law school. And that's what I did. So I went back home to to Los Angeles. I worked as a patent clerk at a at a law firm in in downtown LA, and I worked for a couple of years, and then I ended up going going to law school. And uh, after law school, uh, it was very fortuitous because uh, that experience as a patent agent really helped because it really helped to cement my, uh, it helped to, to confirm that patent law is what, is what I wanted to do. Because, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm a nerd, let, let's, let's face it. And, you know, in the engineering field, I mean, that, that's, you know, I'm proud of it. I, I wear that as a badge of honor. And, you know, as, as a patent attorney, I'm, I'm exposed to technology every day. And, uh, you know, has, as uh, Jose mentioned, I represent Microsoft, I represent Qualcomm, represent, represent so many different companies. And intellectually, it is so very rewarding to be exposed to all these new technologies before they get out to the market. So when I was representing Microsoft, I mean, there were so many things that I worked on for Azure, which is the, the, their, their, um, their, cloud, their cloud platform for, um, for Xbox, right? So many, so many different things that, that, that Microsoft was doing that I worked on the patents and then, and then, you know, I, I knew in my head, wow, this is in the pipeline. Qualcomm as well. Qualcomm is a, is a big client of ours. And uh, Qualcomm, they work on, uh, you know, they're, they're big with 5G. They're the backbone of 5G. And uh, working on, on those patents and then looking at my phone and thinking, wow, my phone is going to be able to do this in a few years. The Internet of Things, knowing that 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 everything's going to be connected from from streetlights to you know streetlights are going to be connected to cars, and you know there's going to be a car accident, and we're going to know we're going to know whether the light was red or green. We're going to know instantly, and that information is going to be sent to the insurance company automatically. So, you know, no more taking pictures, no more litigation of, hey, the light was green, the light was red, let's go to court and figure this out. No, technology is going to, is going to address that. And, uh, and it's really exciting. It's really exciting you know, to, to work on that. Um, so that, that's, uh, and, and here, um, there are, 
I, I think it bears repeating that the patent law career, that was very specific to my personality. So what do I not get as a patent attorney that an engineer would, right? Well, an engineer or an entrepreneur, they actually build stuff, right? They actually, they're the, the creators. And as a patent attorney, I'm not creating. I, I arrive at the end, right? So the, the, you know, the, the excitement of the trial and error, the excitement of, you know, just the, the struggle of, of getting this design just right. I don't, I don't get that as a patent attorney. That's what an, an, that's what an engineer gets, right? I'll give you an example. I've got, I've got a buddy, I've got a buddy of mine uh, from, from college. After, after college, you know, he went, he got his master's in engineering as well. And, and after, he, after he finished, he uh, ended up working for, uh, for Raytheon. And he still works for Raytheon to this day. And whenever I catch up with him, he's telling me about, you know, these fighter planes and these defense, you know, the, these, uh, these um, laser defense systems that he's working on. And, uh, and I think that's really cool, right? I, I think that's, that's really cool. And that's something that I don't get as a, as a patent attorney. But, uh, you know, you, you kind of weigh the pros and cons of, you know, of what your career path might be. And uh, perhaps more importantly, I think it's, you have to really do some soul searching and, and try to determine what's the right match for you. So for, for those of you there, I mean, this is, you know, the last school, you know, of engineering. I, I was, you know, I was sitting where you're sitting several years ago, whether, whether you know, freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. Some of you are, are thinking, well, what am I going to do? Well, yeah, I, I would like to tell you that it's okay if you don't know just yet. It's okay. It's okay. And uh, sometimes it's just as important to know, you know, even if you don't know what you're going to do, sometimes it's just as important to know what you don't want to do. So for, for, for me, at the time, it was, it was engineering. I, I, I didn't. It wasn't, it wasn't the right fit for me, but it might be for you, right? And the other thing that I would mention is that don't be afraid to pivot. So for example, if, if you're an engineer, the, the life cycle of, uh, of an engineer is after a few years, after a few years, maybe you know, four or five years, the engineer either stays on the engineer path or they transition over to management. Depending on your personality, depending on your likes and dislikes, maybe management is, is the right choice. Or maybe you continue to work on these defense systems. It's up to you. It, it, it really is up to you and what I would like to emphasize is just don't be afraid to experiment and don't be afraid to pivot. It's, it, 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 there, there's, with an engineering degree, the beauty of it is that there's so much that you could do. I mean, here, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a patent attorney and I just recently pivoted to becoming an entrepreneur. Right. And it, it's, it's so, it's a field that it's so powerful. And I remember, I still remember the day um, back in college when I realized how powerful uh, an engineering degree really, really was. So when I was in college, and I'll, I'll share the, this little tidbit here. 
when I was in college, it frustrated me that, that I had sweet mates that I lived with, that they had computers. They had their, their, their computers there in the dorms. And whenever I had to work on a project, I had to put on my sweater, my overcoat, my long johns, and I had to walk through, walk through the snow, this is like during the winter, to go to the computer lab to work on, to work on my project. And it frustrated me because I knew that, yeah, and, and back then, computers were really expensive. You know, they're, they're, they're still expensive, but back then they were really expensive. And every time that I would walk to the computer lab in the snow, it, it, it just really bothered me. It, it really bothered me and I felt that it was unfair. I felt that, that wow, you know, they are fortunate enough to have a computer and here I have to do this. And one day it just, it just dawned on me. I just had an epiphany and I told myself, wow, you know what? I'm an electrical engineer and computer science major. I could just build a computer. And that's what I did. I built a computer. And at the time, at the time it was cheaper to build a computer than it was to buy one. So I ended up building my computer and because I built it, I ended up getting the, 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 the best parts, right? The best CPU, the best, you know, the best motherboard, the best chassis, everything. And my, the computer that I built ended up being better than, than the computer of, of my sweet mates. So anyhow, I'm sharing this story because I, I, I want to, you know, in case, you know, you're, you're kind of going through the motions like, like I was in college. I want you to know that regardless of what career choice you choose, having this engineering background is extremely powerful. And, and that, that's, that's something that, that if you forget everything else that I shared, just, just remember that. So speaking of pivoting, so as I mentioned, I am now an entrepreneur. I, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Opjar. And Opjar, what Opjar is, it's, well, here, let, let, me, let me start by saying that the reason why I pivoted wasn't because I was unhappy being a patent attorney. That's not the case at all. I, I love being a patent attorney. You know, everything that I said is valid. Um, the reason why I pivoted was because this, the, the social impact of Opjar was too compelling to pass up. So why is it that, that we co-founded Opjar? What is Opjar? Well, the reason why, why we co-founded Opjar was to address the wealth gap in the country. That's really, that, that's, that's why, why we did this. And as Jose mentioned, I co-founded Opjar with a few of my classmates from, from MIT and uh, from law school. And, and we, we, 20 years ago, 25 plus years ago, we were these kids that were entering adulthood with little to no savings. And statistically, statistically, there are 66%, two thirds of 18 year olds have less than $500 in savings. And statistically, if you have more than $500 in savings, if you're part of the one third, you are three times more likely to go to college and four times more likely to graduate. And those are, that's math. Those are the, the statistics. And I knew, and we knew that we were the exceptions. We just happened to have stumbled upon the right path. But 
for the vast majority of us, we were, we're not that fortunate. So here with, with Objar, what, what is it that, that we're doing? It's very simple, actually. The goal is to funnel as much money to these kids as possible. So we are, we are partnering with schools. Actually, i am spoken to a few folks here in Fresno and other school districts to partner with schools so that every kid in the school district has an Objar account, basically has a custodial account where we could funnel money into. And by partnering with the schools and then partnering with corporate sponsors, then we could funnel money to these kids to incentivize them to perform while in school, for example. So, so rather than, let's say, providing a $26,000 scholarship to a kid that just happened to have left out and stumbled upon the right path, why don't we instead take that $26,000, split it up into over 13 years from kindergarten to 12th grade, and ensure that that kid reaches each of these benchmarks starting from kindergarten. So it's $2,000 each year, whether it's, you know, money for, you know, $20 for each A, or, or if, uh, if Google partnered with us and said, Hey, if you go to, if you're a student at Sunnyside high school in Fresno and you take AP calculus, we Google, we're going to, we're going to put a thousand dollars into your Opjar account. Well, for me, I'll speak, I'll speak from, from personal experience. When I was in high school, yeah, I was fortunate enough to be part of the Esconda program, but if my mom knew that I would have gotten a thousand dollars for enrolling in calculus, she would have told me I needed to enroll in calculus. And my mom to this day, she does not know what calculus really is, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because she understands money and she understands that, Hey, if, if, if there's money there for, and all you have to do is take a class, I don't care how hard it is. You better take that class. And I'm not unique in that way. There's se there several, there several students at Sunnyside right now that I bet would take these advanced placement classes, these honors classes. So that's really the idea behind, behind Objar. And, you know, the, uh, the, you know, like I said, with, I love being a patent attorney and here the team that we've assembled for Objar, we're all senior level executives in our respective fields. And, uh, you know, we could have fast forwarded, you know, 20 years, 20 years, uh, 20 years from now, I could, I could have been retiring as a patent attorney, live a comfortable life and be done with it. But the social impact here, it was just too compelling. It just was. And if it wasn't going to be us, then who? And if not now, then when? And, 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 that, and that's how this was born. And so I, I, I want to I end by, by, by saying again, I want to emphasize that, that with your engineering background, you can pivot like this. You can make decisions like, like this. So again, just keep, keep that in mind what, as, as you think through your career, your, your career choices and your next steps. And again, you know, don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to, to try something and say, hey, you know what? I tried it, it's, it's not for me. Don't be afraid to, to talk to people. You know, here, you know, I mentioned that, you know, I teamed up with, with, with classmates of mine. Keep in touch with your classmates. Several years from now, you never know, you might be launching a company together. So with that said, thank you very much. And I would be glad to take questions.
Uh, awesome presentation, Daniel. And we have a couple of questions uh, already open in the, in the Q&A chat. Uh, the first one is from Vanessa Felix. He, she says, she asks, uh, as an engineer trying to get into law school to study IP patent tech law, what is your biggest piece of advice for me in general and with my law school applications? Uh, yeah, so with, with law school, and I, I just happened to be when I was a, when I was in law school, I was on the I was on the admissions committee. So I I, I have a little a little bit of insight on this. And uh, so law school, ninety percent. Well, let me let me say it this way: forty five percent of the decision is going to be based on your grades. Forty. 5% is going to be based on your LSAT and 10% is going to be based on everything else, whether it's your letter of recommendation, whether it's your personal statement or what have you, or work experience, whatever it is. So 45% grades, 45% LSAT. So depending, I'm not sure what year you are, but you know, if you're a senior, for example, and the grades are done, well then the grades are done, for better or for worse, whether straight A's or, or you know, straight C's. It's done, so they're, they're, they're you know, just don't, uh, don't dwell on it and don't hang your hat on it if, you know, if, if you got straight A's. It's done. You gotta focus on, on, the, on the LSATs, right? Um, but the opposite is true if you're a freshman or a sophomore because now you still have time to focus on the grades. And you know, if you have time, well then you've got to focus on the grades. So if you're, if you are an under, if you're a freshman or a sophomore, I would say just focus on your grades. Just focus on your grades. If you're a senior or if you're in grad school, then you really got to focus on, on the LSAT. And, and the LSAT, for those of you that are not familiar, the LSATs are basically the SATs for law school. And I'll tell you right now, this, and this is very important because I, I was actually, um, back, in, uh, back in law school, I, I taught part-time for Kaplan to do test prep for, for the LSAT. And I'll tell you right now, and I'll tell you with a straight face, the LSAT does not measure intelligence at all. So you're gonna, you're gonna take, and this is everybody, this, this is everybody, not, not anyone, this is everybody. Everybody, well, let me say 99% of the people that take the LSAT just fresh with no, no studying, they vomit, including myself. But that's by design. The, the, the way the LSAT is designed, it's designed to, to weed people out, to discourage people so that they don't, we don't have a million people going to law school. So really, when, when somebody, when I was on, on the admissions committee and I saw an, a high LSAT score, I didn't see that as, oh, wow, this person is so smart. I saw that as, oh, wow, this person was able to juggle studying for the LSAT, was able to prioritize studying for the LSAT with their life. And that that is an important skill. So studying for the LSAT, I'll tell you right now, carve out a good two months of your life. Just carve out two months at least. And not, not four months, four months is way too much. Carve out about two months. And for some people that's gonna be easier or more difficult than others, but, but whatever it is, whether you have to, you know, you have to juggle a job, whether you have kids, whether you're, you have classes, wh whatever, whatever it is, again, the trick isn't, oh, I need to get smarter. The trick is always balancing the studying. Are you able to balance the studying with life? Because at the end of the day, that, it, it, it's life that, that really is, is the tough part. It's not the LSAT. Uh, we have another question uh, from Robinson Navas. Um, 
do you get a feeling like going back to engineering and invent your own things? I feel like you already kind of answered this during your presentation, uh, but specifically and especially after listening to all those new ideas and technologies from your, from your patent career. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so again, you know, I mean, I, since the year 2000, wow, I'm dating myself. So but for about 20 years now, I, I've been in the patent field. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, the, that excitement that I see in, you know, and that I hear in the inventor's voice, um, I don't get that, you know, well, I, I didn't get that as, as a patent attorney. So, um, you know, it was always kind of a, you know, weigh the pros and cons type thing. Uh, so that was the main thing that I missed from an engineering career, my engineering, my limited engineering experience. Um, but it was outweighed by, uh, by the, by my comfort level with, with, with patent law. So what I mean by that is, is just, I, I, I enjoyed seeing new technology all the time. It, it was really cool, right? It was really, really cool. And so it, the choice for me was, do I, do I want to focus on one thing for, you know, for, for X number of months, or do I want to just be exposed to a buffet of things uh, for the rest of my career? And, 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 that's, and that's why I chose that. But I ended up pivoting, right? So, so, so then now with Objar, you know, I, I can't, I can't explain how rewarding it is to, to know that, that with this team, we've built this and we could have this social impact that, um, you know, you can't really put a price tag on it. Um, and, uh, and ultimately that was why I pivoted because, you know, patent law, it, it's, you know, it, it it's, a uh, it's a, it's a comfortable, it's a comfortable life. It is very flexible. I, you know, I've been working from home since 2008. So I, you know, I would, with my, with my older son, I walked him to school every day. I walked him back from school every day. I was able to hang out with them until bedtime. And I, you know, you go to bed like around eight or nine. I would work from, you know, from nine to like, you know, one o'clock. And it was flexible. It was flexible, and and, uh, and I really like that. Okay, uh, how did you? This is a good question from Raphael. Uh, how did you develop your self-discipline? One of my toughest problems is, as an engineering major, is forcing myself to continue to continue learning, to continue staying dedicated to my studies, and to continue being better, even when the subject comes easy to me. Yeah, I think that this is an easy one. You, it, it's your why. It, it, it has to be your why. Like, what? Why are you doing it? You know, what? Why are you there? And, and you know, I I shared my why. My my why was my family. So, so I was, I was on the other side of the country, and uh, and uh, I knew that my family was struggling. And. I knew that this was the way out. This, this, this was the way out. I needed, to, I needed to figure out these problem sets. I had to finish up this lab. So whether it was one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, you know, when, when I got tired, I just grabbed a cup of coffee and a fuerzas, you know, like it, 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 had, it had to be done because it's, you know, it's, that's what's going to get you through. It's, it's easy just to fall asleep. You know, it's, it's easy just to call it and just say, hey, you know what? I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm as ready as I'm going to be, you know, or, hey, I, I only got through three quarters of this homework assignment. That, that's, you know, I'm going to turn, I'm just going to turn it in. And it's going to be that why. Why is it that, that, that you're doing it? That's what's going to, that's what's going to pull you through. Um. Here's another question from Robinson Navas is what would you recommend to do if you want to, uh, want to patent something or create your startup? Uh, good question. Um, well, 
on the patent side, on the patent side, you know, it, it's tricky because, because as an entrepreneur, for, for most entrepreneurs, money's tight. So you really, you, you really don't have much money to invest and, uh, and getting a patent could be expensive. Um, there are two types of patents that patent applications that you could um, that you could do. One is called a provisional patent application, and another one is a non-provisional patent application. So, um, the a provisional patent application is a placeholder application. Uh, it basically it has less formalities than a non-provisional, so it's generally less expensive because of that. Um, so I, I mentioned this because, because you really should get patent protection if, you know, if you even, well, let, let me take a step back. You should seek patent counsel to determine whether you, you need patent protection as early as possible, because for most startups, at the beginning, you know, they don't have customers, they don't have an actual product. What the, the only thing they have is the idea. That intellectual property is everything. So you really want to protect it. And uh, so talking to, to a patent attorney, a reputable one, is really important, right? There's legal zoom out there, but, but that's kind of a do-it-yourself type thing. I would never recommend that. Um, Find a reputable patent attorney, get an initial consultation. You could get a consultation for, you know, for maybe two, three hundred dollars, if not for free. Um, and that would be the first step <clears throat> in determining, all right, do I, you know, is this even patentable? Should I even submit a patent application? And if so, then I would always recommend, I generally recommend with um, with the startup clients, since money is usually tight start with a provisional application which will run you anywhere between two thousand dollars on the uh on the you know on the low side to maybe five thousand dollars on the high side um but then you have a year you have a year to uh, you you submit your patent application and then with that year you can determine whether or not you want to convert it into an actual patent application but in that year, you could do a Kickstarter campaign, right? You could share with investors and see whether it's actually got legs, right? And, uh, you know, and if after the year, you determine that, hey, you know what? That, you know, it, my idea isn't as great as I thought it was. Well, then you walk away and, you know, you spent, you know, maybe two, three thousand dollars as opposed to a non-provisional, which could cost you up to about ten thousand dollars. It's a lot of gold nugs that you're sharing. Um, so I'm going to switch it up a little bit. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Kidos and then another one from Manuel. That they're kind of related, so you can address both of them. Um, Dr. Kidos says, due to COVID, many students are working three jobs because they're afraid to take out loans. Why do you think, especially in the Latino community, that we are afraid to take out take on loans? Also, we never think in saving for retirement, yet we're, uh, we are good saving money for big weddings like quinceañeras or, or other events like that. Um, and then Manuel's um, uh, question is, I know you mentioned pursuing engineering at, at first for the money um, to essentially get your family out of the uh, East LA and, and the issues. Um, having gone to MIT for quite some time and completing your studies, how did you manage to support you yourself financially through the process? Uh, this seems to be a common problem among students now. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's a good question. And, uh, and by the way, this is part of the reason why uh, why we created Optar, right? This this wealth gap problem, you know, there were, you know, I shared the story about my classmates that had computers. I didn't, right? There, um, you know, I bought my house in my 30s and my classmates, a lot of my classmates bought their houses in their 20s, right? So this wealth gap problem is real and we, you know, we live it uh, most of most of us, at least two thirds of us, 66%, we, we live it. Um, so the, I guess the, the way I would, 
I would answer that question is going back to statistics, right? So if you don't go to college, statistically, you are not going to make nearly as much as if you did. And in the STEM field, that's especially so. Because in the STEM field, you know, in engineering, you, the, the, the job prospects are, you know, the, the, your, your expected pay is going to be generally higher than, than other fields. So if we're just talking, if we're talking STEM, which, you know, this is the School of Engineering. So if we're talking STEM, Generally, and I know it's scary to take out loans and, you know, go into debt, but sometimes you have to take, sometimes you have to take a step back in order to take two steps forward. And, and I, I'm, I'm letting you know, you know, again, from personal experience, right? From personal experience, I mean, look at law school. Law school is, you know, law school is a, a whole other beast in and of itself. That was, you know, a, a huge debt. But, um, but you, know, you, you have to do the, the economic analysis of, okay, what am I going to get paid? H how much value am I getting really from this de degree? How much is this going to change my salary, right? So, I, I mean, I, I could have stayed, I could have stayed working as a patent agent, for example. I could have never went to law school. And, um, and you know, I, I, was, I was earning a, a good salary as a patent agent. But then I did the... I crunched the numbers and I saw how much law school cost and I saw how much higher my salary would be just by having that piece of paper. And, and I did it and it, and it ended up working out well. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more questions and the other ones are seem, well seem to be quick. Um, uh, what are some, what is some advice that you can give in regards to knowing when to move from, or when to pivot uh, from what you're currently doing. Uh, in other words, how did you find out engineering wasn't for you? Yeah, so, um, so I mentioned the internships that, that I did uh, when I was in college, and I did uh, three different internships. Um, one internship I did at, ironically, this space and defense uh, firm in, in LA. And then another internship I did um, at this startup um, that a, a classmate of mine actually co-founded at, at MIT. And, um, and then the third one was uh, another, another um, space, and defense, uh, space and defense firm. So um, you're never gonna know unless you actually try it, right? And I guess my advice would be be honest with yourself, right? Be honest with yourself. If, if you feel like it's not, it's not quite the right fit, don't be afraid to experiment with something else. Because for me, for example, with engineering, I thought, you know, my first internship was in space and defense. I thought, you know what? Maybe it's because of the bureaucracy, right? Being in a big company and doing, you know, Maybe, maybe the, the culture was just not the right fit for me. Maybe I need to be in a startup. And then I tried the startup and, and it wasn't quite the right fit for me. And, and look, let me be clear. I don't, I don't want to say that I didn't like the work. I actually loved the work, right? Because in my first internship, it was really cool uh, when I discovered that a satellite that I worked on was actually in space. That was extremely rewarding. But in the grand scheme of things, I'll see, can I see myself working on that project? I mean, I worked on it in the summer, for, for a summer. But the other engineers, the, the non-interns, right, the actual engineers, you know, they were working on it for years. So I, I had to be honest with myself and be like, you know, I, I, I can't do that. That's not the right fit for me. And then with the startup, um, it was kind of a similar experience. It was like, yeah, it's cool. But for me, for my personality, after, you know, after a few weeks, I, I you know, it, it just wasn't for me. And the last two questions is what brought you, brought, brought you to the Central Valley and how 
are the kids selected for Opjar? Ah, good question. So I moved here in 2008. Um, so my, my son, my, my older son's mom, she grew up out here in the Valley. So uh, that's how I landed here. Um, and I negotiated a, a work from home arrangement with my law firm at the time, um, which ended up working out really well. Uh, so that's how I ended up here in the Valley. And uh, as far as how the, the kids are selected for Opjar, um, well, right now, honestly, the, so we have two acquisition models. We have customer acquisition models. We have a B2C model, a business to customer model, where it's just individual customers, right? Anyone could go on to the app store, you know, right now, whether it's uh, the Play Store or, um, or, or for Apple, and you could download the app, right? And, uh, but then with our B2B model, business to business, um, that's where we're partnering with the school districts. And, uh, um, so the idea, the, the general, the objective is to get all kids, every kid in the country, quite frankly, to have an Opjar account. We want it to be just synonymous with, Hey, Oh, here's this kid. He's my nephew. He's two years old. He lives in New York and I know it's his birthday. Cause I just saw on Facebook that it's his birthday. And I'm the Theo that, for, that didn't send him anything. I forgot and I feel awful. But with Objar, I could just send him 50 bucks on the Objar app and I feel good about myself. But then on the, on the school side, you know, like, I, like I mentioned, now you know, if, if we have kids that know, and more importantly, maybe the parents that know that their kid is going to get, you know, 50 bucks for perfect attendance. Well, now you've got the parents saying, Mijo, you better go to, you better go to class. Right. So, so two different angles, but, but that, that's our, that's our thinking of how, uh, of, uh, how we're getting customers. Awesome. That's actually kind of funny when you said that, you know, we, we don't know what calculus is, but we know what money is. Yeah. Uh, well, we want to extend our thank you out to you. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. It was very valuable information and then hopefully, uh, a lot of the attendants uh, took some inspiration from what you showed us today. Um, we want to wish you luck and success in, in Opjar and all your future endeavors. And with that being said, you know, we want to also extend our, our thank you to our, to our sponsors, uh, the VIP Valley Internship uh, Partnership for Cooperative Education Program, and also the Laos College of Engineering and Ada Cap and U. Um, don't forget again, we are the, Application for the VIP is due next week, next Friday uh, at 5 p.m. And if you would like information on how to join Ada Company, the Honor Society, uh, you will get an email out if you qualify. You have to be on top of a certain percentage of your class and within your current year. Um, and just a fun fact, I don't know if you knew this, uh, Daniel, but Dr. Omar Bowles was also an alumni and was part of uh, IEEE HKN, Ada Company. Yeah. yeah, so that one that was pretty cool. There. Uh, with that said, uh, thank you everyone for joining, and have a have an amazing rest of your Friday. Thank you, thank you everyone. Appreciate it. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you.